that uh, criminal uh, end up with a criminal record for using it. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for his question. It's a very relevant and pertinent one. Uh, during the convention that we had last year in Vancouver, we saw openness towards the possibility of decriminalization. It could be an intermediate step before moving to legalization. We all agree, and my colleague made some comments earlier, a young person who smokes a joint when they're 15 or 16 years of age because they simply want to try it should up, end up with a criminal record or in prison. But at present, that's not what this uh, bill is all about. And what's worse, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I'll conclude on this if I may, the government is saying that it wants to protect children, it wants to, to conduct uh, education campaigns, awareness campaigns, but they're saying that instead of giving this money to organized crime, it's going to be in the government coffers. We're talking about billions of dollars that will be generated. Well, if that's the case, uh, why over the next few years did they only set aside $1.9 million for these awareness campaigns? $1.9 million is a 30-second ad on a couple of shows and that's it. So, Mr. Speaker, it's irresponsible. If they were serious, we'd see some uh, measures in the budget, funding that had been freed up for police to train police officers to put in place advertising or fundraising campaigns for the municipalities to deal with schools to prepare for what's coming, Mr. Speaker, because the reality is there's going to be an increase in cannabis use because the government simply wants to make money. This will be a money-making machine for them to wipe out their deficit, and it's a good way for them to gather up the money. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Belchasse, Les Lévis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I'd like to salute my colleague from Victoriaville who made a a very, an exhaustive presentation as to the devastating impacts of this liberal piece of legislation, not only in, in terms of public health, but uh, public safety as well. Uh, when it comes to public safety, and I know that this is a subject of interest to my colleague, I have a question for him. He showed that he demonstrated uh, that the Liberals are just doing this for money. It's clearly what he said. But I'd like to come back to the uh, Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police who said that this is one of the, the con drug consumption is one of the biggest threats to public safety if uh, recreational marijuana is legalized. He, could he tell us more about that? How can, there's already a great deal of crime. We've got uh, impaired driving with alcohol. So how can we reduce the number of accidents on the roads that ha uh, that are associated with the marijuana use. The Honourable Member from uh, Athabasca. Thank you for, I'd like to thank my colleague for that very relevant question. It was, they, they were, it was in my notes, but uh, 20 minutes wasn't enough to talk about such a serious bill. He's quite right. The uh, Association of Chiefs of Police of Canada did, in February, table reports saying that they were very concerned because of this coming legislation to legalize marijuana. So they were urgently in urging the government that, to equip police cars with uh, the equipment to be able to detect marijuana use in drivers so that they can be tested tested for marijuana just as they uh, just as they use breathalyzers but uh, given these tight deadlines they'll never be able to to do it on time mr speaker so if the deadline is legalizing for the 4th because they want to have quite a, a big party on uh, July 1st on Canada Day for 2018 that's what, what we think they're preparing for the police won't have time to respond between now and uh, July 1st, by the time they train the officers and acquire all the necessary equipment, it's, they'll never catch up. So police cars will not be equipped, the training won't have been administered, and we will all be at greater risk on our roads, especially since people who consume marijuana, and I said so earlier, it, Mr. Speaker, 50 percent of drivers believe that they are not at risk. And that's because of a lack of awareness. I quite agree, Mr. Speaker. What's this government said to that? $1.9 million in its budget for how many years for the whole country? Mr. Speaker, I, I fail to see how this is responsible. I personally do not believe it is. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Beaches, East York. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of the Cannabis Act. It closely follows the recommendations from the task force report of last December 
and overall it's a public health approach that also treats Canadians like the responsible adults we are. We talk a lot about protecting young Canadians in this House and it's important, especially important during this particular debate. But at the outset, allow me to spend some time to thank young Canadians and young Liberals in particular. In 2012, the Young Liberals of Canada brought forward a resolution to legalize and regulate marijuana. That resolution noted that millions of Canadians regularly consume cannabis, that billions have been spent on ineffective enforcement that has resulted in expensive congestion in our judicial system, that progressive cannabis policies have been recommended by various commissions and parliamentary committees, and that the existing black market empowers organized crime. Young Liberals and the Liberal Party of Canada called for legalization and regulation, and that is exactly what we have delivered in the Cannabis Act. Now, we know that the status quo is unjust. Tens of thousands of Canadians are charged with cannabis possession every year. Whether or not it results in a conviction, it obviously negatively affects the lives of otherwise law-abiding Canadian adults at the border. Do these Canadians deserve criminal records? Do 43% of Canadians who say that they've used cannabis in their lifetimes deserve criminal records of these criminals? Do 15% millions of Canadians deserve criminal records for having used cannabis in the past year? If I consume a substance and harm no one else in doing so, do not harm myself in doing so, why is it a crime? There's a strong argument that it shouldn't be, and that argument comes is grounded in the ideal of freedom. And, and I know that Conservatives care about freedom. I know that a lot of Conservatives care about freedom because 49% of Conservative members voted for the member from Bose. Now, the only explanation for the continued criminalization of cannabis is this idea that the social benefits of the criminal law will somehow reduce consumption and, and thereby help Canadian society and help others. Now, we know that the criminal law has been incredibly ineffective in doing so when 43% of Canadians self-report that they've used cannabis in, our, in, our, in their lifetime. And we also know that the current approach of prohibition causes more harms than any cannabis use. We know that the black market is empowered uh, by pro prohibition. We, and we know that prohibition is the absence of regulations. I can tell you that I have no, no Canadian that I know, I'm 32 years old, going on 33, no Canadian that I know has ever had a difficult time finding cannabis as a youth. If, if you don't mind, just one moment, please. I'm, I'm very interested in what you're saying, uh, Honourable Member, but there's discussions going on around and it's making it very difficult for me to hear what uh, the Honourable Member is saying. So if people are talking, it's okay, but if they don't mind just whispering more than having a loud discussion, it would make it so much easier for me to hear the Honourable Member, the Honourable Member for Beaches, East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, the black market has no age limit and no quality controls. We also know that there is a better way. With tobacco use, we've seen a public health approach succeed. Not prohibition, but a focus on regulation, restrictions on public use, and, commercial, and restrictions on commercial advertising, and a focus on education. Fifty years ago, 50% of Canadians smoked tobacco. That number is now less than 15%. We don't write tickets to responsible adults for smoking a cigarette or drinking scotch. We regulate and we educate. Our approach to cannabis is driven by public health. There's a strict possession limit of an ounce, an age limit of 18, and provinces can set it higher if they so wish, and a strict but sensible limitations on commercial advertising. In taking this approach, we recognize the potential harms associated with cannab cannabis use, but we do not overstate them. The National Academy of Sciences in January of this year released a literature review of the current state of the evidence and recommendations. Yes, we know that there is an association between high cannabis use and psychosis. It's dose-dependent and may be moderated by genetics. We also know that there is an association between high alcohol consumption and, 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 and mental health, and we are not criminalizing alcohol. Yes, we should seek to limit the harms of, of gambling, we should seek to limit the harms of alcohol, we should seek to limit the harms of cannabis, but prohibition is not the answer. Our policies should not be permissive, but nor should they be fear-mongering. Now, we've struck, the, I think the, the leader of the Green Party recognized this as well, but we've struck that balance between Canadians as responsible adults and a public health approach.
legislation on this subject that satisfies a civil libertarian like myself and a former police chief like my neighbor from Scarborough Southwest is no easy feat. Cam H supports our public health approach, as does the Canadian Nurses Association. Now, a few comments from constituents of mine. One constituent, Mark Bartlett, says education is, is the key here. And, and, and education, not fear-mongering, but based and grounded in facts. An education focused on responsible use. Abstinence is the absence of education. We should focus on responsible use that's related to driving and, and preventing driving offenses, related to the risk of addiction because of the frequency of use. The, re the potential for reduced ac academic achievement because of the frequency of use. Uh, a, a few suggestions from constituents related to this legislation. So it's, it's a wonderful thing that we're removing criminal offenses for five grams and under for young Canadians. Uh, my constituents are certainly skeptical of the value of any criminal, uh, uh, criminal records or criminal charges in the use of the criminal law for possession, uh, possession at all. Sale to minors. There's obviously an incongruity between the sale of alcohol to minors and the sale of cannabis to minors. Now, uh, a number of constituents have, have raised this, and, and, and it's not to be part of this legislation, but forward-looking uh, uh, record suspensions and amnesty. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, uh, allow me to uh, end where I began. Once we've passed this legislation, it's, it's important to undo the past injustices of this incredibly outdated law. Uh, and, and to suspend the criminal records of, of any Canadian affected by a possession charge and record. This was part of the original Liberal Party of Canada policy resolution, and we should certainly see that policy through. Now, a, a few comments on uh, this idea that it, it's driven by dollars, which I've heard from uh, my Conservative colleagues from the other side. We've been very clear that this is not a, a revenue-driven approach, as, as it largely was to, uh, to diff varying degrees in Colorado, but it's a public health approach, and that we're not looking to maximize revenue, we're looking to undercut uh, uh, the black market, and where we do take in revenue at the federal level, we, we plan to spend it on treatment and education. When it comes to the social harms of cannabis, and, and I can't emphasize this enough for my conservative colleagues on the other side, when. And, and take as just one example of the, of the potential social harms of cannabis versus a substance like alcohol. We know from this uh, large literature review from the National Academy of Sciences that yes, there are obvious risks for women consuming cannabis during pregnancy. We also know though that fetal alcohol syndrome uh, is, a, uh, is incredibly costly to our society. 3,000 Canadians a year are affected by this uh, and, and yet we I don't hear anyone in this House proposing a criminal law or a ticketing option related to alcohol. We know that the answer is regulation and education, and that's exactly what this legislation proposes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague across the way from Beaches uh, in Toronto for, I think, a very balanced speech. I, I took the bill back to the riding with me and spent a lot of time studying it when we, right after it came out for first reading in, in uh, April, around April 13th, I took it back and read it through over the Easter weekend and shared with my constituents what I distilled from it. And it was that sense of balance. I was, I was you know, concerned about a number of aspects. I also want to make sure that public health is central. I'm a mom and a grandmom, and I may be the only person who grew up in the 60s who never smoked cannabis. I have concerns about putting anything in my lungs, and I've always been cautious, and I'm cautious with my kids. And that's why I thought the bill did a good job in terms of, of having public information, having strict controls, and if anything, as I mentioned earlier in this place, the one concern I have about the bill as drafted is that the punishments are overly harsh in some of the cr criminal aspects of if you're over 18 and you're distributing marijuana to someone under 18. But so my, cons my question for my honorable colleague is, uh, how will we confront what I think now are some fear-based tactics? I've looked up the Colorado experience online, researching it since we've been sitting here and I hadn't been able to get in on the debate. It seems to me that, the, that what we've heard about Colorado, and perhaps the honorable member can throw some light on it, isn't the case. The kids in Colorado, the teens in Colorado, were already consuming cannabis much more than teens in other states before they took the measures to legalize. Their experience thus far appears to be cautiously optimistic. They're not seeing more fatalities 
or car accidents. They're not seeing more organized crime. And the governor, who not wanted this to pass when it came forward as a referendum, now says he wouldn't want to go back to prohibition. He describes the war on drugs, in his words, as a train wreck. So uh, getting this right is going to be important for Canada because I think we're going to lead the way for a lot of jurisdictions. For Beaches, East York. Uh, well, thanks to the uh, leader of the Green Party. I, I would uh, second that notion that the war on drugs is an abject failure. Uh, cannabis, no less than, than other substances. Uh, and when we look at the Colorado model, we see that those who uh, were not convinced in the first place have seen the successes and have been converts. I expect the very same thing to happen here in this House. And I would emphasize as well that uh, our approach is even more focused on public health than the Colorado approach, especially relating to the limitation on commercial advertising. And so I think we'll have even more success here in Canada. And comments, the Honourable Member for ladies, uh, Nanaimo Ladysmith. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm inclined to support the bill uh, to get it to committee for further review, but I'd like to hear the members' comments around an uh, important implementation element, um, which is the decriminalization part of the marijuana discussion. Uh, I. We have seen that spending over $4 million a year to prosecute marijuana possession, simple possession, uh, 22,000 people that got a criminal record in 2014 alone, um, hours of court time, all for something that the government and a great majority of the uh, community that I hear from agree should not be a criminal offence at all. And so given that... Uh, young Canadians in particular are uh, most likely to end up with a criminal record for simple marijuana possession, given that it's taken this government quite some time to get to this point in its mandate um, and fulfill a major election promise, and given the extreme impacts of a criminal record on young people, I'd like to hear the members' comments on how we can move towards removing the penalties for simple possession uh, well ahead of the July 1, 2018 implementation. Well, member for Beaches, East York. Uh, well, thanks to the member for the question. Uh, I have, uh, I'm on record multiple, on multiple occasions that I don't think we should continue arresting Canadians for simple possession, and I don't think we should continue charging them. Uh, I, I, I can say with, I was comforted when I hosted a drug policy town hall in my riding, and I had a panelist who was a member from the Toronto Drug Squad uh, and said that's simply not something that happens in Toronto. It's obviously still a problem in other jurisdictions. It's obviously still a problem in some cases for... Uh, certain minority groups who are un unfairly prejudiced. Uh, I will say, um, while my government uh, is not looking to decriminalize in the interim, um, and you can see some worries with uh, dispensaries having popped up. I had one right next door to me. Uh, with, without having interim regulations in place, that there, there are some credible worries, which is why I focus more on this notion of record suspensions and amnesty post-legalization. And I think there ought to be a consensus in this House, and I've heard Conservative colleagues say we don't want to see people negatively affected by criminal records. I think we can agree on this in, in, on this side of the House, and I expect members from the NDP agree as well. And so a really a focus post-legalization on an expedited record suspension process, I think, is the, uh, the most obvious fair way forward. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for his speech. Uh, I guess the one thing that I'm concerned about, I have four kids myself, um, and concerned about the regulations and the laws that's written by the, uh, by the government, about how it deals with uh, not just possession of, of marijuana, but how it deals with distribution. Because the one thing the member has neglected to talk about is that there's no, there's no legal recourse for somebody that's got five grams or less in, when they distribute the drug. So what it's essentially saying is that uh, you can't sell to kids, but kids can sell to other kids. That's going to be completely fine as long as it's five grams and under. I just wanted to ask the member across the way through the speaker, does he think it's okay for kids to sell marijuana to other kids? Thanks. For Beaches, East Europe. So, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the goal of a, a, a strictly regulated system is to ensure that we are not allowing people off the street to sell marijuana, whether it's kids to kids, whether it's others to, to kids. The, the notion of the five grand limit is to ensure that we avoid giving criminal records for possession 
to, to kids that are, that are uh, possessing five grams and under. Uh, I would note, though, that I, I, I do not want to see criminal records. And I'm not sure if, if the member opposite is aware of how small uh, five, five grams is in terms of selling. So I, I also wouldn't want to see major criminal records punishing young Canadians for uh, the sale of such a small amount. But principally, the focus here is on, is on possession. And I, there obviously should be uh, penalties, whether it's a ticketing penalty, whether it is uh, some diversion, uh, not a harsh criminal penalty, but some form of diversion in our criminal justice system for people who are caught tra trafficking, regardless of amount and regardless of age. But I, I don't think a harsh criminal penalty is the answer, but obviously uh, no penalty at all is not the appropriate answer for selling outside of a, a strictly regulated framework. Questions and comments, the honourable member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and through you, I'd like to, to offer my, my thanks to, the, to, I think, the very thoughtful um, and reasoned comments offered by my colleague from Beaches East York, um, who, who, who clearly has, has, is speaking to members of his community and, and has given this issue a great deal of thought. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I'm glad that he recognized the distinction between the approach that was taken in Colorado and Washington, which was overwhelmingly a commercial model for the regulation of cannabis. They passed referendum and, and ballot initiatives that really focused on legalization and revenue collection. And the Canadian approach has been fundamentally different in that our approach has been a public health approach directed entirely to reducing both the social and health harms. And as I've traveled across the country and talked to parents with kids who are concerned about their kids, they're worried about three things, basically. They're worried about the health of their kids. They're worried about the effects that cannabis can have on the health and of their developing minds, and they want to restrict their access to it. They're worried about the social harms to their kids, whether they're going to finish high school, who they're going to be associated with. And if they do get involved with, with cannabis, what type of people do they have to do business with? And finally, what I've also heard overwhelmingly from Canadians is they're worried that their kids are going to end up with a criminal record. And so our government has approached all of those harms in a very comprehensive way to look at how do we do a better job of reducing those social and health harms. And so I'd ask the member if he could perhaps expand on his experience and his reflection after conversations with families and parents in his community. Member for Beaches East York in 60 seconds or less, please. Huh. Well, uh, thanks to uh, the Parliamentary Secretary. I would say simply this. I mean, there's no perfect solution to consensual crime like this. If you want to stamp it out, good luck. It's impossible, whether it's gambling, whether it's alcohol addiction, whether it's, uh, whether it's cannabis. Uh, the, the status, w w w frankly, w w whatever it is, there, there's no way to stamp drug use out completely, including cannabis. We know that uh, way, tackling s supply and consumption these methods simply do not work through, through aggressive law enforcement. So we have the status quo, we know it doesn't work, and what are the alternatives? And there is an overwhelming, uh, overwhelming consensus for, from every drug policy expert who has studied the subject is that you don't, uh, the status quo of prohibition is a failed model and, and you ought to look to regulation and education. And I think taking that public health approach uh, and particularly looking at restricting commercial advertising uh, and balancing that with treating Canadians like the responsible adults we are and, and recognizing that Canadians should be free to, to make decisions for themselves as responsible adults. Uh, I, I think it's important that we strike that balance, and I, and I think we have. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Kootenay, Columbia. I just want to point out that we have 10 minutes. If the Honourable Member is splitting his time, he can give, the president, give his uh, speech, and then the questions will begin when we resume debate. The Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I will be splitting my time, but since it'll be another day, we'll provide you the name at that time. I can say with some confidence that this bill has tremendous interest among my constituents in Kootenay, Columbia. I held a telephone town hall on this issue on March 14th, and over 3,300 constituents stayed on the call for the entire hour. That's how much interest there is. And much of what you will hear in this speech reflects their views, and I thank them for that. It's estimated that growing cannabis and selling it makes up a significant portion of the economy in parts of my riding. And certainly the product is well used, legal or not, by many people, young and old. Those who grow marijuana in the Kootenays are not part of organized crime. They don't see themselves as criminals. Rather, they believe they're just small-scale farmers producing a herb that's received a bad rap. Well, I don't think that's completely accurate either. I do believe that it is important for post-prohibition licensing to include small producers and co-ops, and not just the large corporations who are currently offering medical marijuana. 
That leads me to one of the biggest problems with this bill, Mr. Speaker, the lack of detail. Canadians were promised a piece of historic legislation that would break new ground. What we got was a frame with much of the picture missing. Manufacturing licenses will be provided to producers who meet undetermined standards. They'll be set by regulations we haven't seen yet. It will be legal to sell marijuana, but it is entirely up to the provinces to determine how. Again, no details are provided by this bill. The age is set at 18, but provinces can change that too. In other words, you might be able to grow cannabis, but we don't know how you'll get a license. You might be able to buy it, but we don't know where. You might be able to smoke it, but we don't know when. That's a lot of unanswered questions, Mr. Speaker. Let's look at the issue of minimum age for a moment. Health officials and researchers have been very clear that using marijuana before the age of 25 can be dangerous to brain development. I'd like to read briefly from an article by the American Psychology Association. Jody Gilman, PhD at Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Center, used an MRI to look for brain changes in 18 to 25-year-olds who smoked marijuana at least once per week, but were not dependent on the drug. Compared with non-users, the smokers had changes in the shape, volume, and gray matter density of two brain regions associated with addiction. Participants who smoked more often had even more significant differences. The Canadian Psychology Association recommended to the government's panel that the minimum age be 21. The government has chosen to ignore this scientific and medical advice and lower the age even further to 18. Of course, the impact of marijuana used by a pregnant woman could be even more severe. According to information provided to me by the senior policy advisor to the Minister of Justice, Heavy cannabis use during pregnancy can lead to lower birth weights of the baby. It has also been associated with longer-term development effects in children and adolescents, such as decreases in memory function, the ability to pay attention, reasoning and problem-solving skills, and an increase in hyperactive behavior. So the question is, will consumer marijuana carrying labels warning expected mothers to avoid use of the product, such as we see on tobacco and alcohol? Bill C-45 is silent on this issue. Yesterday, the Canadian Medical Association Journal published a powerful editorial about Bill C-45. The editorial, written by Editor-in-Chief Dr. Diane Kelsall, calls the minimum age of 18 too young, given the scientific evidence. And Dr. Kelsall warns that growing marijuana at home will give young people too easy access. She's also concerned about the lack of national standards for retail sales as well as the limits on the potency of various strains. Dr. Kelso wrote, the government appears to be hastening to deliver on a campaign promise without being careful enough about the health impacts of policy. It's not good enough to say that provinces and territories can set more stringent rules if they wish. If Parliament truly cares about the public health and safety of Canadians, or especially our youth, this bill will not pass. As I said earlier last March, I held a town hall in my riding to hear from constituents and their thoughts about marijuana legalization. Their opinions were widespread, naturally, and many came with questions. I heard from many people who thought legalization is a good idea. I heard from others who oppose it. I heard from producers that said they didn't want to get shut out of the action, and retailers said the same. Deb Kozak, mayor of the Nelson of Nelson, B.C., was one of my guest panelists on the call. She said she wanted to see a framework that would help her municipality develop appropriate zoning and bylaws for marijuana retailers. And sadly, so far, the Act is lacking on that front, too, downloading that responsibility to the provinces. And many constituents want the money that comes from legal sale of marijuana, uh, which is another area not covered in the proposed legislation, that is the taxation aspect, to be dedicated specifically to education, uh, sorry, deterring the use of marijuana and other drugs, and to reducing and treating the health impacts of using marijuana. They do not want the revenue from legalizing it going to general revenue. One question I received was about crossing into the United States. Will legalizing marijuana in Canada make border crossings more difficult? I did know, so I wrote the Minister of Justice and asked, and here's what the Minister's office responded. Travelers should be aware that while some U.S. states have legalized recreational cannabis, cannabis remains a controlled substance at the federal level in the U.S. As a result, 
travelers seeking to enter the U.S. may be inadmissible if they admit to having consumed cannabis in Canada or disclose to U.S. authorities any plans to purchase or consume cannabis while in the United States. Let's say that again. Travelers seeking to enter the U.S. may be inadmissible if they admit to have consumed cannabis in Canada. Canadians doing something that will be legal in Canada may be barred as a result from entering the United States. And that's an issue that the government needs to deal with. Perhaps we should retaliate. It's illegal to consume alcohol under the age of 21 in the United States. So perhaps we should ban anyone from entering Canada if they admit to having had a beer at age 20. It's imperative that the government work with the U.S. authorities to acknowledge our sovereignty and the ability to make laws that are different from theirs and to work out what's going to happen along the border. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to repeat what many of my NDP colleagues have said. The biggest missing piece of Bill C-45 is the need to provide full pardons to any Canadians convicted of possession of small amounts of marijuana, marijuana in the past. Last December, the government of Vermont, Jerry Shumlin, pardoned 192 individuals who were convicted of possession. Basically, he said, my hope was to help as many individuals as I could overcome the stigma and struggles that too often go along with being convicted of marijuana. I appreciate the government is interested in ending the failed war on drugs and that the prohibition on cannabis, which has harmed more people than it has helped, is finally coming to an end. And I hope that the government will get it right. There's work to be done, Mr. Speaker. This law is not finished yet. There's a lot of holes in it. So while the NDP will support Bill C-45 on second reading, I encourage the government to listen to members of this House and take the opportunity to correct the many deficiencies of, of the bill when it goes to committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member will have five minutes for questions when the debate returns. Or, uh it's almost midnight. I'm getting tired. I can't even remember what I was going to say. But uh, when, when, when it resumes is the word I was looking for. It being at 12 a.m., this House stands adjourned until later today at 2 p.m.